this. Welcome to what is the first of we hope will be a series of CCFG seminars running roughly at monthly intervals from now pretty well through the year with a break for summer. And they'll all have a common theme of applying continuous cover forestry in different locations. Um, just a few words about the way we hope this presentation will run. Our speaker will talk for about 30 minutes um, and then we'll have time for, question, for, Q, for questions. As far as the Q&A goes, if you put questions in the chat and Michelle and I will try and facilitate them. Um, if there are questions that are still unanswered um, at the conclusion of the hour or the 65 minutes, then we'll try and pick those up later after the event. There will be a recording made of the presentation and the discussion, and that will be available to participants probably early next week through our YouTube channel. So on behalf of the CCFG, I'd like very much to thank Adam Thorogood for being our first volunteer. It shows what happens when you suggest something um, because it was Adam who suggested this in a discussion that we, the group has had earlier this year. Adam is based in Wales where he works with the Woodland Trust and he's had appreciable practice of applying continuous cover forestry in restoration of ancient woodlands and that's what his chat's going to be about. Adam, thanks very much and over to you. Great, thanks Bill. Right, I'm just going to start sharing my screen um, so you should all be able to see this now um, yeah thanks Bill and Shell and thanks for the opportunity to uh, speak to you all today um, yeah and thanks also for attending given that it's such a sunny day outside as it is in Wales <laughs> um, right so yes my talk is going to be about um, applying CCF in ancient wooden restoration I'm going to give it a bit of context. I'm going to talk about defining ancient woodland. Um, hopefully, the meat of the presentation will be um, three case studies from Wales, uh, three sites that I've been involved in managing. And, um, and then I'll talk about CCF and restoration and some overlaps and obstacles um, at the end. And then there'll be time for questions. OK, so to start, um, just to put CCF in a specific context, um, that is the rest restoration of ancient woodlands and particularly plantations on ancient woodlands. So I'm, my, my talk is going to focus on sites which are plantations rather than ancient semi-natural woodlands. Um, but they are all considered ancient. And I'll go into the detail of that in a bit. Um, and I'll ask questions about what are the objectives of restoration and how could um, continuous cover forestry or irregular forestry or selection forestry, how, how could this method of, of practicing forestry help to restore ancient woodland sites that have been planted with conifers. So just to situate this work, um, we're looking at uh, climate change and biodiversity loss and these synergizing um, effects and the uncertainty which that brings for future decision making about woodland management and land management as a whole. Um, and putting a lot of demands on our landscape, these are multiple demands and then often they could be conflicting. Um, in Wales, there's been a lack of woodland management subsidy um, for the past probably eight years. Um, and that's put an emphasis on productivity, meaning that sites seem to um, have to kind of pay, pay their way without any um, subsidy support. There has been some subsidy support, but not, not wide scale in Wales um, for the past several years. Um, this work operates at different scales depending on the, the type of woodland and its owner or the organisation making decisions about its management, just private woodlands, state managed woodlands, NGO woodlands. Also, another, another important aspect is that species characteristics can often conflict. So we've got different differing ecologies of native versus non-native plants. And I just want to also uh, bring your attention to a report that's been produced recently by the Woodland Trust, the State of the UK's Woods and Trees, uh, which was published last week. Um, and just taking 
one aspect of that kind of top line statement that although woodland cover is gradually increasing, woodland wildlife is decreasing. Okay, so that hopefully just contextualizes what we're going to talk about a bit today. So defining ancient. So the woods I, I work with are ones that are that, they, that feature on the ancient woodland inventory for Wales, the AWI. And this was a desk-based study um, carried out in 2004 and then a reiteration of it in 2011. Um, but this needs ground truth. In. So a lot of my work is going out to sites identified on the inventory and looking to see whether they are indeed ancient. And there are a number of different ways in which you can do that through survey. Um, but just to look at the resource we have in Wales, that there's uh, just under 95,000 hectares of ancient woodland in Wales, and this is 4.5% uh, of the land cover, which is greater than that across the whole of the UK. 25% um, of this ancient woodland is in the public forest estate, so managed by MRW. Um, so these woods are those with specific sets of ancient features, and these can be identified further through field survey, um, such as ancient woodless, woodland specialist species, um, veteran and ancient trees, the presence of coarse woody debris. So I've just got some photos on the right hand side, you can see an ASNW, maybe what you might think of if you're thinking of ancient woodland, and below that, a uh, stark difference of a planted ancient woodland site, but both are considered ancient woodland in the inventory. So just looking at pause sites in Wales, what are the features of these sites? So they are often um, homogeneous stand structures with an even age, single species, their plantations. You can see a few examples on the right hand side, all of these um, taken from, from mid Wales. Um, they're often on steep, rocky sites with little infrastructure. Um, therefore, there's a lack of management history. They're often overstocked, dense, with a lack of crown height due to competition. Um, sometimes they were underplanted, and so they retain pre plantation trees, such as oak, ash, birch, and small leaf lime clinging on within the matrix of conifers. And they also retain often assemblages of native woodland, and we can group these together in the NBC categories. So within this part of Wales, I'm often finding um, W9, W11, W17 um, MVC woodland types, but within the pause situation, within the pause context, these are very fragmented, maybe just clinging on in certain pockets around craggy outcrops that weren't planted or down riparian um, edges of streams. Um, and these sites often have a low fertility because of the soils here in Wales and are often on acidic soils. So that just gives you an idea of the context of pores in Wales. So thinking about restoration, what are we aiming for? We're not aiming for uh, returning to some sort of pristine um, condition of, of habitat from the past. Um, we have to be pragmatic about the management of these sites. Um, and on the right hand side there, you can see um, some of the guidance that exists within the UK about the management of, of pause sites. So UKFS says um, uh, that in pause we should ensure that features of ancient woodland remnants are protected and consider uh, progressive restoration to native, native woodland. And then um, a bit of a stronger approach within UQWAS, that the owner manager shall maintain and enhance or restore features and areas of high conservation value within pause and um, urges the decision maker to take a precautionary approach. So those are, that, that kind of sets the scene in terms of forestry standards. Um, but, you know, um, the Woodland Trust approach is brought together in a series of modules, um, restoration modules, numbering uh, one to five, which are all available on the Woodland Trust website. So I urge you to have a look. Um, and one of the kind of academic um, papers underpinning uh, the, the trust's approach to ancient woodland restoration is, is that of um, Brown and Curtis and Adams, which was um, published in 2015. And it was, it was a real focus on um, understory plants and the different management regimes that might enable a suite of, of, of plants to, um, to, to be maintained and enhanced through the management of ancient woodland. And at the, at the, in their conclusion, they urge that um, an approach that's focused less on conifer removal and more on the moderation of light and shade levels might be, might be more appropriate. 
performance management, and they urge for, a, um, or they make the case for, gradual approach to restoration. So this gradual approach has um, underpinned the Wooden Trust approach to restoration, and has underpinned the work I've been doing um, over the last six years for the Trust. Um, and that's how we've, we've built in um, the use of continuous cover forestry as a more gradual approach to um, stand change and the management of these sites. So I ask the question here, why not clear fell and start again? Well, that's, you know, that would reduce everything back to a baseline, which um, would, would ignore a lot of the very important features that, that are um, maintained within these board sites. So, I'm going to move on to three case studies from Wales. So, um, these are all within um, what, what the Trust called a treescape. So, our, our treescape, our area of focus of our work in Wales is called Dubby to Dwyrid. It's between the two catchments of the Dwyrid River in the north and the, and the Dubby River in, in the south of, of the treescape. So all of these sites are within that, that focus area and that's the majority of my work within, within the treescape. Um, two of the sites are, are privately owned and one of them um, is part of the Wooden Trust estate. Um, all have commitment to restore within their management plan and all have within them fragments of the W17 plant assemblages, which are typical of the Atlantic Upland Oak um, community identified through the NBC. So we find um, fragments of um, understory species like bilberry and heather um, and uh, canopy species such as um, sessile oak and downy birch um, with holly hazel in the understory. Um, all of these sites have a kind of suite of, of, um, of plant species which are typical of the W17 habitat. Um, they've all had thinning operations to transform them to an irregular structure, but they are in transition. So this is a, a process um, and we've just embarked on this journey really, I think you could say. Um, and also I just wanted to add at the end, there's a lack of ear browsing, which is um, a big factor here in, 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 in West Wales. We, we have very, very low numbers of deer, which would be different to um, Many of you listening, I'm sure, in other parts of the country and other parts of the UK. So just making a start with red oak wood. Um, so this actually doesn't contain any red oak at all, uh, but it's the name given to the company that, that woodlotted this site and sold it off. Um, it's 9.34 hectares. Um, it's the owner cunningly bought two lots out of the nine and managing a woodlot um, within a wider um, set of lots uh, presents a series of difficulties. Um, and I believe that continuous cover forestry can really help within this context of managing a small um, lot within a, within a bigger uh, woodland unit. Um, the site's within the Cadwardris Triple SI, um, and it's also an intimate mixture of um, Douglas fir and Japanese larch planted in 1965. Um, I'll go on to why that's interesting and, and important in a second. Um, so in 2018, uh, we carried out a thinning operation, a graduated density thinning and a line thin um, very, at the, right at the top of the site where it was very difficult access and very difficult to extract the timber. Um, so there had been some thinning work carried out in the past, but in, in very easy to reach parts of the, of the site. So um, just some measurements that the basal area before the thin was 32 and we produced it down to 28 uh, post thin. But this is a gradual, process of reduction of conifer basal area in order to promote the regeneration of um, native species in the understory, but also to um, prioritize the crowns of um, the broadleaf species which are clinging on within the, the conifer matrix. Um, and we were very keen to take this very slowly because we were worried about the, the wind progress. Um, the site's in a very narrow valley, so it could really be a pinch point for high winds. Um, so you can see some of the photographs here um, of the thinning operations at the top right there, you can see the graduated density thinning. We've removed uh, one rack in the middle and then um, we've thinned the matrix either side. We can see in the bottom left that there's um, some birch regen coming up. I visited the site yesterday actually and heard the first cuckoo I've heard this season. Um, so I wonder what would have been the case if this site had been clear felled would I have heard a cuckoo when I was uh, walking around yesterday? 
Um, the picture in the middle um, is one of the other lots, which was also uh, an intimate mixture of Douglas fir and larch. And the owner, as a precaution against Phytophthora remorum, I should say that it does, the, the disease does not exist across the site, but he, um, he's decided to remove all of the larch, which has led to a very heavy thin, um, leaving the, the stand very open. But it's actually downwind from the prevailing winds of, of the site I'm looking at. And we used that as a real indicator that we could maybe go a little bit harder than we wanted on the thinning because there had been no wind blow um, of this neighbouring lot. But uh, the owner here has had to underplant um, in order to um, fill up the gaps. Um, right, moving on to the next site. Um, this site is called Achboyf, and this is the this is uh, part of the Wooden Trust Estate in Wales. Um, it's twenty two point one hectares. Um, so this site is um, part of the AFI network. Um, the AFI is a, an organisation based in France, which is the Association Futaille Irregulaire, um, and it's an organisation that promotes um, the use of irregular forestry and also promotes the, a, a monitoring network to, um, to monitor the use of uh, continuous cover forestry methods and um, its, its um, impact on forests uh, across Europe. Um, so Ashboy um, is one of these sites which is in the AFI network. Um, but there's a series of repeated inventories which the AFI um, suggests that sites within the network uh, take part in. And the first of these inventories was carried out in 2017. So that looked at um, stand structure, basal area, um, volume of different species, um, and it looks at uh, the levels of large wood, small, uh, medium wood, and small wood. So you get, you get a really good idea of stand structure from this, uh, from this inventory. Um, we've also carried out a very detailed uh, baseline uh, of ecological monitoring. Um, so uh, we've, we've commissioned um, uh, monitoring of um, epiphytes, so lichen surveys and also flowering plant surveys um, based around the, the sampling plots that the AFI uses. Um, and also a uh, breeding bird survey, and we've also worked um, with Aberystwyth University to carry out a soil and air um, fungal spore uh, monitoring, which uses DNA metabarcoding in order to work out the species that we have here. So all of this um, detailed ecological monitoring was carried out around the time of the first AFI inventory, so 2017. Um, and then we've had um, a second phase of transformation thinning. So, so before the site passed into the ownership of the Woodland Trust, um, some, tra some, tra some thinning work in order to move it towards uh, an irregular structure gradually was carried out. So this is the second phase of that transformation work in 2018 within um, a, a Scots pine and beech stand. Again, this is another intimate mixture of Scots pine and beech. And we've tried to prioritize the Scots pine in order to allow um, the, the, the recovery of the Scots pine crowns, which have been very uh, suppressed and shaded out by the, by the dense beech canopy. Um, so we had we tried two different um, uh, operations. On one plot, we removed the middle row, which had been left in between the, the previous thinned um, racks, which were, which, were, which were taken out five years previously in the first phase. Um, and then a thin of the matrix either side of those racks. And then in plot two, we carried out a selective thin, um, so less systematic, uh, which led to a much lighter removal of volume. So this is a kind of watch this space really, because uh, we're, we're coming up to the next um, uh, inventory for the AFI, uh, which will be next year. And we're then going to repeat a lot of these ecological surveys. So we'll get some really, really useful data um, when we do that. Okay, moving on to the third site. Now this is Koydeska Alas. So this is a site that I'm part, I part own with a group of um, six other people. Um, and so it's collectively owned and managed. Um, and I should say that I, I, I can't um, claim all of the work from this site at all. And I know some of the own, other owners are in this um, session. So I should say that this is a collective uh, approach to um, implementing CCF uh, on a small cause. Um, so uh, the site was planted in 1955 with um, Douglas fir, Japanese larch and Sitka spruce, uh, but retains hotspots of um, W17 oak woodland. 
And um, the decision by the group was made to focus on um, removal of larch um, as a precaution against Phytophthora morum. Um, so most of the thinning is being carried out in, in the larch stands. And um, this is not an intimate mixture as the other two previous sites were. So these are distinct stands of single species. Um, so we can see uh, some of these pictures on the, on the right hand side. This is where we um, have a, a large canopy um, which we thinned in order to promote uh, broadleaf uh, regeneration in the understory, which is which is really which is really going very well. We've got a diversity of, of broadleaf regen coming up, so a mixture of rowan, birch, oak, hazel. Um, we've also got patches of, of um, stands of uh, bilberry and heather within the understory, which you would associate with um, W17. So we'll continue to, to lightly thin and remove the. Uh, the larch from the canopy and, and releasing the broadleaf understory to, to come up into the canopy. So they're currently in the waiting room, waiting for the, the canopy uh, space to be, to be granted them and then hopefully they will, they will shoot up. Um, so the basal area um, has been reduced within the larch stands um, down from 32 down to 20 over 10 years. Um, what, we do have a bit of a problem on the site with, um, with bramble and this is one of the things I wanted to to, to drop in the, the discussion and consideration is that um, the care which needs to be exercised when uh, reducing basal area of conifer, um, we don't want things to run away and for coarse vegetation to, to get out of control. Um, one thing I should add is that uh, the, the site before it was acquired um, was down for a, a clear fell funded by uh, Better Woodlands for Whale and a restock, um, but we decided against that. Um, and we did uh, do carry out some small poop fells, which um, small group fells, which uh, were mainly removing citrus spruce, which had uh, butt rot, uh, and those were restocked with funding from Better Woodlands for Wales, uh, with a mix of uh, broadleaf species and uh, some Scots pine. And this has led to a kind of variable density of sands across the site, which I think is a really um, a really interesting structure, and I think it grants the site. Um, certain amount of resilience. Okay, so moving on. Um, now just to look at some elements of um, continuous cover forestry and its um, application to restoration. Um, so one of the, one of the, one of the issues that we, we face is that the, often the plantation species are very shade tolerant. So many plantation species that um, are used in, in Wales, particularly we have uh, Western hemlock, um, as a conifer species and often looking at sites with, with a broadleaf plantation species, uh, namely beech. And these two species are very shade tolerant. And as we thin um, the, the site and open up the canopy, um, the conditions are created for, um, for the regeneration of these species and they might um, outcompete the regeneration of uh, site native species, which we're, which we're after. Also the emphasis on, on large trees um, through CCF and the, the, the development of, of, of more healthy crown structures it increases the, the potential of seeding of these of, of, of conifers within the stand. So through opening up um, in order to uh, safeguard ancient woodland features, in order to control the light levels, we have to be very careful um, about the spread of, of conifer regeneration. Um, and because this is a gradual process, we're looking at really managing mixed stands over the long term, I think. Um, this is not something that's going to happen overnight. We're going to open up um, a, a, a dense conifer um, canopy, and over time, uh, there will be re regeneration if we get things right, if we get the level of thinning right, um, and we're gonna get both conifer and broadly regeneration. So that, that needs thoughts and consideration, and it needs tending operations. Um, I think it's good that we get regen at all, and that's a useful thing, but we need to work with it and consider how we work with it when we're, when we're restoring all sites. So yeah, it takes detailed observation, monitoring, and an adaptive approach to management. So we can see this picture at the bottom here. This is um, part of the NRW um, Forest Estate. This is in Belfinant, uh, where we've got a uh, Douglas fir canopy. Um, we've got a mixture of re regen, broadleaf, and um, conifer, and that, this has been respaced to favour the broadleaf regeneration under the under the Douglas canopy. Okay, I, I realise I need to be a bit quicker here. 
So um, I just thought I'd um, show you some of the uh, papers that have come out recently, looking at the, uh, the benefits of continuous cover forestry to various different um, biodiversity taxa. Um, so these, really, these, these papers and many more really support the use of CCF uh, when, when biodiversity and um, habitat management are high on the list of objectives, if not you know, the top objective or equal to uh, timber production. Uh, we're looking at here at um, the benefits for saprozygic beetles, um, implications for the transformation for woodland birds, and also um, the maintenance of soil fungal communities. So here are some, some uh, quotes from these papers, um, but you know, I think that one of the most important ones to look at is that a complete harvest um, will cut photosynthetic input of trees to ectomycorrhizal fungi leading to the death of mycelia and thus an initial release of carbon to the soil. This is from the Kim et al paper released this year. Um, which they go on to say, thus we show that continuous cover forestry could maintain mycorrhizal fungi which are responsible for the acquiring of scarce nutrients in boreal forests. So going back, um, just looking at some overlaps between the aims of restoration and the, the principles and practice of continuous cover forestry. Um, It's important to preserve forest soils um, uh, for the process of, of, of restoration because of the, um, the, because the, of the importance of healthy forest soils for ecological processes. Um, so maintaining fungal diversity, maintaining the hydrology of the site, the ability to, to absorb and store and um, cope with uh, large amounts of water, and also the, the, the kind of re reinitiation of nutrient cycling as the canopy is opened up, as the, um, the light and the heat regime changes um, once, once light uh, penetrates down to the forest floor. Um, we're working with natural processes. So we, we're, we're looking at trying to um, initiate natural regeneration um, of um, site native species. Now, we might not have uh, broadleaf seed trees on site, but they might be in the, in the wider area. And, um, management of the conifer canopy will create the conditions for natural regen to happen. Um, um, early transformation of, um, of conifer stands will build in wind resilience. Um, so there's a lot of evidence to show that using CCF in the management of, 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 um, of plantation stands will build this wind, wind resilience through um, a diverse and complex understory. Um, often we're coming to these sites late in the day, and this is um, a late stage transformation, which means we have to be very careful and very gradual and slow in the changes we make. Um, but it's important also that, to maintain and enhance old growth features. And these are some of the really important um, species that are clinging on in these hotspots within poor sites. So epiphytes, epiphytic lichens, and ferns and mosses, large trees, and amounts of coarse woody debris, particularly broadleaf. Um, debris. Okay, um, I just uh, the picture on the top uh, in the top right there is a um, is a lemon slug, which is a ancient woodland indicator slug species, um, which was taken by my colleague Alistair uh, at a poor site uh, near Newtown, um, where there's been um, a transformation thin in Sitka spruce, um, and um, he found this, this lemon slug there, which they're very rare and they keep themselves to themselves, so they're, they're hard, to, hard to find, but he found one uh, on this, which looks like a baby leaf, I think. Um, so, you know, if, if, if the approach had been taken to Clearfell, the site, we would have lost this um, ectomycorrhizal association um, uh, between the, the baby leaf and the, and the, the birch, the spruce, um, the oak on site, and uh, we probably would have lost this, this lemon slug. Um, so it just goes to show how important these um, ecological processes and these relationships are. Um, moving quickly on to look at some obstacles. So as I said before, thinning can increase undesirable regeneration. Um, that of hemlock and beech. Also the spread of invasive non-native species unless the understory is managed through tending operations. Um, if, you re if we reduce the basal area too much, we can lose control and lead to vigorous bramble or bracken growth, and you can see um, two examples there in the middle um, of that happening. 
but also I think within private sites, the choice to use CCF or even the choice to, to restore the commitment to that is the choice of the owner, which is, which is only right. But also it means I think that, um, that if the site changes hands, it could be um, you know, a very different course of management could take place. So that, that is an obstacle when we're looking at um, continuous cover forestry being a long-term management approach for the, for the benefits and the, um, the impacts of CCF to be shown. It might take several um, fins to get towards more of a kind of um, uh, um, single tree selection approach to, to extraction. Um, but also one thing that I found difficult is that the, the draw of large clear fell operations for contractors in Wales, that um, it's hard to get a, the, the contractor uh, base to, to really focus on these kind of light small operations that need to be carried out sort of little and often when transforming sites. Um, so those are just some of the obstacles that, that, that I found um, when, it, when presented with using continuous cover forestry for ancient wooden restoration. Adam, can we start to wrap up? Yeah, I'm wrapping up right now. So that is that's everything for me. So thank you very much. <laughs> um, and hopefully, you know, in the future we can meet again. This is a CCFG meeting from 2018 with Wales. So hopefully we can do that again soon. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thank you very much, Adam. Uh, wonderful overview of your experience on a range of sites in Wales and some really interesting things you brought out. We've got a few questions. Well, I'll use the chair's privilege to start. Um, for those of us who work in parts of the country where deer are present, um, we have a certain, what's the word, envy of the situation you were describing. And I suppose the question is, how long do you think you're going to be able to continue the approach as you get increasing deer pressure? Mm. That's a really good question. Actually, I saw a deer um, just north of Mahuncliffe, uh, near where I live, um, last week, which is um, in a part of the public forest estate that I know very well. And that's the first time I've ever seen a deer there. And it was a, a row buck, I think, on its own. It just skipped over the track and up the bank. Um, so, you know, if I see one, then they're around. Uh, and I think they, they're going to be increasing in number. Um, I don't, I don't know how long it's going to take before we start to see an impact, um, a visible impact, and start to kind of see browse lines in, 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 in our woodlands here. Um, uh, you know, I, I think there is, there's some really good um, approaches to deer management um, being, you know, taking place in, um, in Wales further east, where there is much more of a deer population. So, so hopefully, um, you know, working together through initiatives like, um, you know, deer initiative, kind of deer action groups, um, looking at the management of deer on a landscape scale, I think is going to become increasingly important. Um, but I couldn't give you a time scale as to when <laughs> it's really going to have an impact. Um, okay. I hope that answers. Um, no, that's fine. I've, okay, I've got a question from Jackie Dunn, which I need to check. There's a couple of questions. I'll take the first one. Um, have you done any research on the level of light, dapple light, and its impact on the the ancient woodland flora. Um, well, yes. I mean, this is the the paper that I uh, mentioned by Curtis um, and Brown, sorry, I should say, uh, which was funded by the Woodland Trust. Um, so that was published in two thousand and fifteen. That looks at the impact of um, changing light levels on on um, ancient woodland specialist ground flora, um, and and it, and it shows that. Um, yeah, a, a gradual approach to changing the light regime is very, very important, and that um, uh, too rapid change is going to shock these these species, which are clinging on, and they're very used to living within these these um, dappled shade conditions that are created by the the plantation um, structure. Um, so yeah, there's work out there. I think I think there's a lot more that needs to be done, particularly um, linking um, ideas of um, canopy management and um, basal area reduction and how that impacts uh, the, the, the spread and the, and the diversity of these um, uh, ground flora species. So um, I think, yeah, look, look at the Brown and Curtis um, and Adam's paper. Um, but yes, I think there's more, there's much more work that needs to be done. And hopefully some of the outputs from Ach Hoyf coming 
uh, possibly next year, the year after, will we'll add to this uh, body of data as well. Okay, um, we've had a couple of questions relating to beach and its undesirability or otherwise mm -hmm. um, in the woods you manage. And I think the thrust is to what extent do you treat beach differently um, in, in your restoration because it's a broadleaf species as opposed to the conifer um, component of pores? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. I think I think there's there's different approaches. So um, I think the approach that would be taken on the Woodland Trust um, estate might be different to that which I might um, work work out with a with a private owner. So most of my work is actually with with private owners, um, and it's it's a really difficult one because there's there's lots of beach um, in this part of Wales. A lot of my work at the moment is in there, and and um, there are a lot of uh, sort of specimen beech trees on, on some of these boar sites. Um, and, you know, they, they are maybe the only large diameter trees on the site, providing a huge amount of, um, you know, habitat. Uh, and, um, but they're also, they are a seed source, so they're, they're producing a lot of seed uh, and, they're, and they're really hindering the process of, of, of regeneration of, of, of site native species. So it, it's, uh, it's a very difficult one. And I, Think that what, what's really needed is uh, the, the retention of these trees. Um, maybe if there are enough on the site, some an approach to, to veteranisation, which might um, well, I don't know, it might it might produce some uh, sort of veteran features which are needed in some of these large trees. Um, but also, I think that what's needed is a tending of the understory to remove beech where it's um, where it's uh, suppressing the regeneration of, of, of the desired. Um, site native species. Um, I think I think one thing is to actually work, try and work with uh, the regeneration of, of, of beech and hemlock, um, if, if that's what you're getting. And actually what it can do is help to kind of keep down levels of coarse vegetation, so it can provide a sort of second, a lower canopy, which can help to um, maintain shaded conditions to some extent. Um, but I think that they have to be observed and it has to be built into the management plan that if, if, it's, if the understory is clogged with that sort of regen, that then there's a pro an approach to tending it and respacing, which can then uh, bring on and recruit the, um, the site native uh, regeneration that you're looking for. Okay, I've got a plethora of questions, which I'll probably not manage to keep track of. <laughs> but one, a couple have touched on something I was thinking about looking at the pictures which is to do with the terrain and the slopes and the harvesting machinery. Yeah. I mean, you touched a little bit on contractor issues, but can you be a bit more specific about how you actually, what you actually use on the different sites? Mm. Okay, yeah, good question. I mean, all three of these sites were um, tractor skidder operations. Um, the Koideska Las, uh, the group owns a tractor and um, every every year removes a certain amount of timber um, and that's um, uh, um, removed from the stand but with a winch and then skidded to a, to a loading bay. Um, and then the same with uh, red oak wood, that was, um, but that, that was like a one-off operation where um, it was motor manual felling within the, within the stand uh, and then extracted to the ride or the, or the, the forest road um, with a winch, with a, with a tractor driven winch. And then uh, there was a small harvester on site, which, which only went up and down the, the forest road and the, and the rides and then processed um, all, of the, all of the timber. Um, so that was, that was how that happened. And the same um, with Athboy. Uh, these are all, yeah, tractor skidder operations. Um, you know, and I think it's really important to retain the skill and also the kick and carry out these, these operations. Um, and that was my, my comment really was that a lot of uh, contractors um, have purchased large scale uh, harvester forwarder um, kits and they need to repay the loans to buy those, those bits of kit and then they're drawn to and driven to um, these big uh, large volume clear fells uh, which can help them to maintain uh, the repayments but we're losing some of this kind of smaller lighter uh, more nimble uh, forest machinery and at the same time we're losing the, the skills to operate and, um, and carry out these, these operations. That, that's, that's my experience in Wales. Okay. Thanks. Um, 
had a question which I think relates to the Red Oak Wood, I think, which is you showed the site where one of the owners had removed all the larch and just left the dug fur. And I think you touched on the fact that you were reassured by the fact that there was no blow or very little blow. Just to put it in context, do you know what kind of um, dam scores those sites were in terms of? Okay, so um, I used a, um, I did I did use forest scales at the time of putting the forest, <laughs> forest uh, the, the fairly license in, um, but I also used a height diameter ratio. Right. Um, and we were approaching 80, so kind of on the threshold of um, the uh, the viability of these um, these stands for um, for thinning, um, so that was why yeah. So with with the red oak case, um, we put in quite we put in a higher volume for extraction on the thinning license, and actually only um, extracted half of that um, because working on site with the contractor and um, yeah carrying out the operation. Um, we decided to, to, to be quite light with what we were doing um, and that we could then think about coming in three years, four years, five years later um, and, and taking out a little bit more. Um, but yeah, we, um, yeah, I used high, high diameter ratio rather than uh, dams to, 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 to work that out. Okay. Um, going back to an animal related question, Grey squirrels have reared their head. Is, are these an issue in these woods? And do they impact the restoration strategy? Yeah, yeah, definitely they do. Um, yeah, so we see a lot of squirrel damage um, on um, all of the, the all of the species that we're <laughs> trying to, to 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 encourage. So yeah, birch and oak um, around sort of 20, 30 years old um, often gets uh, a lot of a lot of squirrel damage, but also uh, beech and and sycamore as well. Um, at the moment, it's not. I think that yeah, none of these sites have had um, a large amount of uh, squirrel damage. You know, to 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 really hinder the process of um, of, of the kind of regeneration of a, of a, of a native understory um, and a you know that can then go on to, to become canopy. Um, also. I should say Ask Boy um, is, is within the, um, the release area of the Pine Martin Recovery Project, which Vincent Wildlife Trust um, ran. Um, so we've got that in, we've got that influence of um, Pine Martin there. There are there are two den boxes um, and it's been used, I'm, I'm not sure about this year, but it's been used in the past for um, hitting, hitting Pine Martins. So it's so it's provided a pulse of new pine martins into the area. So that's definitely having an impact, um, and yeah, even if it's just that kind of landscape of fear, which uh, which a kind of predator creates on the squirrel population. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're seeing this the, the very success of the pine martin recovery project as they spread throughout throughout mid Wales and beyond. So that's that's definitely something that's kind of uh, in you know that we in our toolkit to really reduce the impact of, of grey squirrel. Okay, thanks. Um, we've had a question about, I think in one of the case studies, you described an issue of bracken colonization. Mm -hmm. And the question was asked a little bit, well, how are you proposing to manage this? In the sense that the bracken could crowd out the yeah. any natural regeneration. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And I, that's why I put that in, because I really, I'm, I'm a bit worried really about certain stands um that I, yeah that i think are a little bit too open but um this is the case of uh and and the, and the useful thing there is that we are um, a group of seven um and we have we carry out regular work days um and we are really focusing on bracken management um so yeah that's something that i think we're going to be doing we're going to be doing by hand and we're going to be cutting uh, the bracken back um, in order to see whether we can get more natural regen. Um, I think what's happened is that we've got we've got the large canopy and we've got we've got a lower canopy of broad leaves. And then um, this is only in certain areas of the site, so a very a very kind of small compartment. Um, 
we then we then got we haven't got the the younger regen the saplings coming up under that and that's i think because we may have opened up a little bit too much um and i think as the that as the the lower canopy increases then that will help to to shade the the bracken out a little bit and if, i think if we keep on with our our management of it then um, then that should have an impact too um I mean, this is the, the, the benefit of having a collective of people managing a woodland, so you have more person power. Um, you know, a lot of these sites are privately owned, but very rarely visited, um, very rarely visited by the owners as well. So in that situation, um, they would not have the, the same amount of focus and observation that, that Coydesco Lass has. Um, so, yeah, it's a very similar site. Red Oak Wood occupies a very similar position in a, in a valley just to the north. Um, and there, we, we don't have the same, although although the conditions are appropriate and, and bracken is there, the, the base of area is still a bit higher. And um, yeah, we're going to be very careful about, about managing that to, to, to um, prevent the kind of the release of a lot of bracken growth. So if I can add as a supplementary, is the message that you're kind of putting across is it's quite important in the first interventions not to let the base of area get too low. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and this is why it's, it, was a, it was a very gradual reduction in basal area in 2019 when the first operation was carried out at Red Oak Wood. Um, with, 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 with Coydesco last, I, I am speaking about a very small, um, maybe, maybe just over a hectare area of a, of a 12 acre, sorry, 12 hectare woodland. Um, there are other areas where, and actually in the photographs, um, the, the basal area is much higher and the bracken, the bracken is not there, you know. So yeah, I think it's just a word of warning really about, um, about really, really being careful about that basal area and, and it's reduction in a gradual process. So you've got, you might have your, your target that you're aiming for, um, but that can be done over successive things. Um, and I think it's also just important to say that the, the basal area, the target threshold for basal area to get regeneration of that species is much lower for um, broadleaves than it is for, for many conifers. So, that's that's another thing we have to kind of think about. I've tried to kind of hint at that in the in the presentation that um, that as we open up, as we reduce the basal area, we're going to make the conditions better for conifer regen, and hopefully better for broadleaf regen as well. Um, but there are, you know, if, if no broadleaf regen is forthcoming, then the conifer region has to be controlled, and, and then maybe the approach would be to do some enrichment planting, some underplanting with, with with broadleaf species. I think that relates to a question I was just going to take you on to. Okay, great. Is how do you find the light demanding broadleaf saplings are persisting under what is a partly conifer, possibly beech canopy? And are you using quick second thinnings or second interventions to release them? Mm. And how are the owners reacting to this proposition? Okay, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, so I think that we're, we're trying to focus the, the second thinnings on areas of regeneration and that, that they are, as, as we open gaps in the canopy, we're getting, we are getting cones of regeneration, but it can be a mixture of, of conifer and broadleaf species. Um, but that, that's where we're aiming the next, the next phase is to open up these, these cones of regeneration further. Um, and then to tend the, um, the conifer regen to remove it, to, to respace it. I showed that example from the government. Um, but I should say that, you know, I did say at the start as well, that these, these three sites, um, I think less Coydesco last, but the other two, are really in the, what I feel to be the first phase of, of this operation. So we've yet to see, um, although we're starting to get regeneration uh, within uh, the understory of Red Oak Wood, um, and there was there was existing regeneration, broadly regeneration within pockets, and that's where we've kind of we've haloed around these pockets of of, of, of mainly beech regen, sorry, mainly birch regen. Um, so yeah, I mean, this is the the kind of the the approach of CCF in following these natural processes, where the following where the regeneration is happening, and then working with that, opening up um, gradually around it. Um, and then the, the the second part of the question about the owners response to it i mean is that to do with the fact that i mean yeah it's a complex one and maybe needs to be unpacked a little bit is it to do with the the the, the response of the owner to it to a change in composition uh, away from conifers to, to broadleaves or 
I, I suspect um, the question will no doubt join in if I think it's wrong. Um, but it's more to do with the fact that the second intervention will probably be quite light. Yes, yeah, okay. And okay. might not wash its face. Yeah, that well, that's the, that is the case. Yeah, and that, that's I think this is the the issue as well that we I, I feel that um, more subsidy support could be created for the, some of this uneconomic work, um, particularly because of the multiple benefits that that um, sites managed under continuous cover principles um, can, can offer. That they're you know we're currently existing in a in a kind of dearth of of, um, of subsidy. Um, but yeah, that is that that is a big issue that um, this this second phase might not might not wash its face. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Okay, that's a supplementary on the Bracken uh, question or subject, which is: Has there been any consideration of cattle or, I suppose, wider grazing animals mm -hmm. to help you control the Bracken? Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's another thing to, to bear in mind that the, 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 um, the topography of these sites, that they're often very steep. Um, but yes, I mean, this is something that I think that um, we're exploring a project I'm working on with um, Snowdonia National Park and RSPB, um, the Celtic Rainforest Project, um, which is a European funded life, life project. A, a big element of that is, is grazing, is conservation grazing in woodlands. Um, and uh, Helen Upson from the RSPB, who's the grazing specialist, is, is working with, with graziers in, in Merionid and within Mid Wales and, and further south in order to try and um, create, a, create a, you know, a, a network of graziers who, who have the, um, the livestock that can be used for this, for this for just this, this purpose, really, for kind of pulse grazing, um, coarse vegetation in woodlands. So, yeah, I think it's something that's, that's growing. There's also um, an organisation in Wales called POMT. Which um, supports conservation grazing um, across a number of habitats, but, but also woodlands. Okay. Um, a question to dealing with conifer natural regeneration. If it occurs, um, do you retain it to obtain a marketable size material, or do you try and eliminate this as a cost? And I suppose it may be species dependent. Yeah, this is a really good question. I think this is the you know, really the crux of the use of CCF for restoration. Um, that, you know, I think that it depends, goes back to the owner's objectives. I mean, if, if the owner, um, if their objective is to restore the site to site native broadleaves, then they would, they would have a different approach to, to conifer removal. But I think we have to be pragmatic in, in the restoration of these sites. And what, what, what I was trying to get across earlier was that we, we, we should, we are looking at the management of mixed kind of the broadleaf stands um, through, through using CCF for restoration. And that we, we have to um, acknowledge the importance of, 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 of managing conifers within, um, within, within these woodlands in order to um, create an economic return. Um, but also they have functions within the stand, you know, so often they are, like, like I said before, they're reducing the amount of coarse vegetation and um, and they are helping to create side competition for um uh, for broadleaf species and for other conifer species so um i think it would it really goes back to the owner objectives but i think that if you look at a private sites such as boy let's um that we are um we're, we're taking a pragmatic approach that where we have conifer region um that we're, we're maintaining it and as long as it doesn't impact too heavily on um, the other factors that we're trying to manage for, namely the, 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 the health of the ground floor within the understory and the, and the appearance of broadleaf regeneration alongside conifer regen. Okay, thanks. Um, we had a question which went back to the harvestman, um, and you may have said it, but I can't remember it. Do you have permanent extraction works within these woods, or how, is the, how have you dealt with the layout? Yeah, yeah. So permanent extraction racks are, are a must, um, and that's that's what we've uh, put in place in in all of these um, in all of these woodlands. Um, and um, yeah, just to just to minimise the impact of uh, machinery on on forest soils. Um, 
yeah, sometimes depending on on the slope, you know, sometimes set them up as a kind of herringbone pattern coming down to to the ride. Um, but that is, yeah, that's integral, I think, to, to using this approach of restoration. And um, roughly, what kind of spacing have you used for these rides? Okay, so um, the the stand in Atboy is quite a strange, quite unconventional in terms of its structure, um, and that uh, a rack was put in every 20 meters, um, just because I think that if you used, say, a one in six or a one in eight um, pattern, um, that would have, it wouldn't have quite worked with the, with, the, with the stand structure as it was. So, so a rack was put in initially, this is in the first phase of works, every 20 meters. And then um, coming back to the second phase, um, then the middle row, so every, 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 10, every 10 meters was then removed in the second operation. Um, but often, and with the case with red oak, we, uh, red oak wood, we're using um, a graduated density pattern of um, one, one in six. So remove, remove every, um, every line in six and, um, and then thin uh, the matrix either side of that line, taking out a smaller percentage as you go towards the middle line, which is retained, and then that come, that middle line is then taken out um, at the next inning. Okay. Um, question, which I think you've mentioned it one side, but I'm not sure about the others. Are you doing systematic monitoring across all the, the sites? And if so, how is this done and how often? Okay, yeah, really good question. Uh, and I think this is a big this is a big factor for uh, the use of continuous cover forestry in on private sites is that there is not really any support for for, for carrying out monitoring and and the importance of detailed monitoring for the application of CCF is, 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 is you know, these two things are very very close um, and yeah so uh, Asboyth is um, a site where um, because it's part of the AFI network. Uh, there's been a very detailed uh, monitoring program across um, 10 sample plots within the wood. Um, so those uh, will measure um, diameter of breast height and top height um, within these sample plots. And um, it will um, it will measure the uh, species diversity and the diversity across age classes and also um, dead wood. So that's what the AFI um, protocol um, monitors. Um, and then um, within red oak wood, um, I used uh, point sampling, so just used relative sweeps um, within the stands. Um, so I've got uh, a pre pre um, thinning um, inventory, and I did I recently did a post thinning um, inventory as well, and that was that they were they were both post, both um, point sampling approaches using relative. Um, and then with Coy Lascalas, um, done a mixture of um, sample plots um, and uh, real estate speeds. Um, but I think with Coy Lascalas that I really like to establish a much more um, robust monitoring program, um, which hopefully we're going to be putting into place um, this year. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I just would say also that there's the um, irregular, um, irregular forest net, ir irregular silver culture network in the UK, which has created an abbrevi abbreviated um, protocol uh, based on the AFI, but is a much uh, much more simple um, monitoring protocol. Um, so that's something that I think that would be great to to, to roll out wider. That's the um, irregular silver culture network. Right. Um... We're pretty well close to closing time, but I think we can take one or two more questions. I had a question that, and I think you mentioned you're in, a, in an area where oak woodland would be natural dominant type, but presumably you have ash. And if so, does ash die back, does ash die back influence in your restoration plans? Yeah, that's a really good question. Yeah, so so normally ash is um, a, a a smaller component of the of the of the native woodland um, 
species mixture um, and often in areas of base enrichment, so within riparian stream edges, finding ash. Um, yeah, it's, it's a huge, has a huge impact. Um, um, I mean, it, it's, it's, yeah, I, I don't really know what to, uh, what, what, how to answer that because it's yet to see uh, what the impact really is. I mean, the impact of ash dieback on the roadside ash is, is huge and catastrophic. And there's, you know, uh, there's a big program to deal with, with, with roadside ash. But within the context of a woodland, I think mature ash that um, succumb to ash dieback uh, and, and live with the, um, live with, with ash dieback, and, you know, that has to kind of, they have to recontract it every year. Um, we could kind of maintain these trees within the canopy for longer, we can maintain the mature trees because they are they're not in a kind of target zone that's going to be um, dangerous, hopefully. So we have the opportunity to try and um, work with natural regen of ash and see whether there's any resistance. Um, but, it, but yeah, it's, it's a much smaller component compared to the oak and the open birch and rowan and, um, and hazel. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Um, right, well, we're past five, which is when I said we'd finish. And I know Adam has some um, domestic duties to attend to very soon. So I, on behalf of the group and everybody's attended, I'd like to thank you very much for a really excellent presentation and for dealing with all these different questions. Um, it was a really nice talk and I think to me, it, Show a lot of the benefits that CCF can, or CCF approach can bring <clears throat> to restoring native woodlands, even on what appeared to be initially quite um, difficult and unpromising sites. And really look forward to seeing how things go. Yes, yeah, so great. Thanks. On behalf of the group, thank you very much. Also, thanks to everyone who attended. And our next um, seminar, I think, is due on May the 20th, when Phil Morgan will be talking, will be known to many people, will be talking about applying CCF in the diversification of even age spruce plantations. Anyway, Adam, thanks ever so much. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Yes. Thanks, Michelle, as well. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, everyone.